Virginia today. Saturday afternoon, beautiful day, just beautiful. We're about to, beautiful day, just beautiful. We're about to see an artillery display, and uh, you'll see what that is in just a few moments. And I head on over now to the uh, visitor center where the family is waiting. <laughs> thing on the bottom is, and, and it comes up here and what it did was it with the weight on the bottom would keep it plumb this way and swing it this way sideways to keep it level on level ground and then you sit down here and you name to a little peep site and you set the degrees of elevation like you want to shoot 1800 yards you'd set all the way out or shoot off the top notch of it and you name off the top of that out there and you the gunner would sit here and tap this side here swing the gun around with the trail spikes and you put that in. Anyway, and you didn't aim the gun, but Paul pointed it down. Because they didn't really consider it aiming it because it's just kind of hard to aim something like this. And that the number three guy, which is the guy back here, he would be directing the fire. How do you fire? How do you operate this? Operate it? Well, pretty shortly, he's gonna, we're going to get ready to do a demonstration of how it's actually fired. Gonna, he's going to talk to you a little bit about it and everything. <laughs> and he's going to, um, we'll go through with that. So when you see the volume, are you just going to hear the sound yeah. of it? Yeah. You won't see anything. This help. That's Harper's Ferry. Yeah. Well, you see where that bridge is over there? Yeah. It's right over there by the bridge. <laughs> yeah, let's go, let's go listen to the talk. Oh yes. In fact, I think there's another group down in town today. Been down in town, we've seen. Yeah. I know who they are. Uh, they come sit down right here on the ground. I'll wait till Mike comes up. Stand next to me, Dan. There you go. National Historic Park. My name is Ross Kimmel. My friends and I are volunteers here at the park. We uh, 
represent the Baltimore Light Artillery, which was an actual Confederate artillery battery that uh, fought here at the Siege of Harper's Ferry in 1862. Now, what we're going to do this afternoon is I'll talk to you a little bit about the Siege of Harper's Ferry in 1862. It was primarily an artillery battle. And then we're going to talk about artillery in the Civil War. We'll bring the men out. We'll do some drill for you. And we'll cap the whole thing off by firing the two guns. And that's over with. You can come forward and take a closer look at the guns and uh, talk to the men. Uh, Harper's Ferry, as you probably know, was a real hot spot during the Civil War. In fact, it had been since before the Civil War, the John Brown's raid. It was a site that was tremendously uh, uh, strategic. It uh, stood astride the water gap into the Shenandoah Valley. This is the front door into the Shenandoah Valley, which was the breadbasket of the Confederacy. Not only that, uh, Harper's Ferry commanded some key uh, commercial routes. You have two major rivers coming together here, the Shenandoah behind me and the Potomac over here. Also, the c &O Canal, which runs on the uh, Maryland side of the Potomac, connected Washington, D.C., the capital of the, uh, the Union, with western Maryland and Pennsylvania. All the coal that kept Washington warm in the wintertime came down the c &O Canal. Not only that, the uh, b &O Railroad, which connected the port city of Baltimore with the Ohio Valley, came through here. So Harper's Ferry was of tremendous uh, strategic importance but it was extremely difficult to defend, because look where it is, low ground surrounded by high ground. Uh, being in Harper's Ferry in time of war is like being fish in the bottom of a barrel with people up on the rim shooting at you. The key to defending Harper's Ferry was controlling the high ground around it. We're standing on Bolivar Heights, which is about 670 feet high. Across the Potomac in Maryland is the south spur of Elk Ridge called Maryland Heights, about 1,200 feet high. Across the Shenandoah in uh, what is now the border between West Virginia and Virginia, this was all Virginia then, is Loudoun Heights, about 1,500 feet high. In uh, 1862, the Confederates uh, took, undertook their first aggressive action against the uh, Union forces. The Confederates have been everywhere successful in the war up to that point. The federal Federals had tried to capture Richmond since the summer before, and everything they tried failed. Uh, Robert E. Lee convinced the Confederate High Command that now was the time to take the war into the North. There were several important things at stake. For one thing, there were congressional elections coming up in the North in the fall. And Northern public opinion was really flagging on the war effort because they were losing. And the casualty lists were getting longer and longer. There were a lot of Peace Democrats running for office in the North. Maybe if the Confederates came into Northern Territory and won a really stunning victory, this would be all they would need to get a lot of Peace Democrats elected to the Congress. More importantly than that, the Confederacy was trying to get foreign recognition of their claim to nationhood. If they could get England, get Great Britain to formally recognize the Confederacy, then France would follow suit. And this would open the way for direct military aid, such as France gave the United States during the Revolutionary War. So Robert E. Lee convinced the uh, Confederate High Command now it's time to move his army onto federal soil. He uh, crossed the Potomac down in Montgomery County in early September of 1862 and moved to Frederick, Maryland where he expected to get a warm reception from the people there. Uh, he was frustrated on this account. Most Marylanders who were pro-Southern lived more in Baltimore and Southern Maryland than they did out here. Now, something happened that he didn't expect to. There was a garrison of about 12,000 federal soldiers here at Harper's Ferry, the Railroad Brigade, under the command of an old U.S. Army regular officer, Colonel Dixon Miles. His brigade's job was to defend the railroad. He had all of his troops here in Harper's Ferry. When Lee moved into Maryland, he expected the 12,000-man garrison here to retreat. They didn't. They were ordered by the Federal High Command to stay put. They were also joined by 2,000 troops from Martinsburg, West Virginia, Martinsburg, Virginia, now West Virginia. So the Federals had about 14,000 men here at Harper's Ferry in Lee's rear. So he decided before he did anything else, he had to break his army apart send some of it circling back to neutralize this large federal force in his rear. And what came out of that was the Siege of Harper's Ferry in 1862. On uh, September 14th, September 13th of 1862, uh, some fighting developed up along Maryland Heights. Now, Miles made the mistake of not sufficiently commanding the high ground around Harper's Ferry. He had a lot of troops here on Bolivar Heights, but this isn't the highest promontory. He had 2,000 men on Maryland Heights, but they were all really green troops. Some of them never even fired a gun. And he figured Loudoun Heights was so precipitous that nobody could get up there. So he didn't bother putting men up there. This was to be a fatal mistake. Fighting began to develop on the uh, 12th of September up on Maryland Heights. Uh, and again,
in on the 13th. Also on the 13th, Jackson began to approach from the west with about 12,000 men. And the troops of Walker's division actually managed to get up on Loudoun Heights, where Dixon Miles never thought men could get. They even took cannons with them. They took them apart and moved them up the mountainside piece by piece, dragging them with long ropes. On the 14th, the uh, Confederates sustained a large all-day bombardment of Union troops here on Bolivar Heights, down on Camp Hill, and down in Harper's Ferry. <coughs> the Federals tried to fire back, but because they were firing uphill, their guns couldn't reach the Confederates. So the Confederates really were shooting fish in a barrel uh, during the siege of Harper's Ferry. Towards the end of the day, uh, Stonewall Jackson, who was an overall command, thought he was going to have to undertake an infantry assault on Harper's Ferry on the 15th. So he massed A.P. Hill's Light Division down here along the Shenandoah River for an assault on the 15th. On the morning of the 15th, the Confederates reopened their bombardment. The Yankees shot off what ammunition they had left and then surrendered. So the only glory the Federals got out of it was the night before, about 1,500 Federal cavalrymen were able to get across the Potomac into Maryland where they managed to elude uh, federal vedettes. They struck north to Hagerstown and actually succeeded in capturing uh, a, uh, General Longstreet's ammunition train. That was about the only glory the federal sal salvaged out of this. So on September 15th, uh, the garrison of about 12,000 federal soldiers were surrendered right here on uh, Bolivar Heights, the largest surrender of U.S. troops until Corregidor during the uh, Second World War. And as I said, this is largely an artillery engagement. What you see here before you are examples of two of the kinds of guns that uh, Jackson had available to him during the siege. <coughs> he had a total of about 50 guns ringing Harper's Ferry. The first gun on your right with the black barrel is, a, for the Civil War, a very up-to-date piece of ordnance. It's called a three-inch ordnance rifle. It's got a wrought iron barrel and is rifled inside. This gun fires a pointed projectile. It looks like this. And with that rifling, the uh, projectile spins and bores its way through the air like a uh, quarterback's forward pass in football. <coughs> the ball is pointed, he throws it with a spin, it goes a long distance, it's very accurate. The other gun is actually an outdated piece of ordnance, but Jackson had about 20 of them with him. It's a model 1841 six pounder, it's a smoothbore gun with a bronze barrel. It fires a six pound projectile like this, no rifling, the thing tumbles through the air, <coughs> something like a, a basketball player's attempt to throw a basketball forward. It's not going to go as far and it's not going to be as accurate as the quarterback's forward pass because it's a round ball and it's tumbling. The, uh, and Jackson had uh, approximately two dozen of these guns available to him during the uh, siege of Harper's Ferry. They fired a number of different kinds of projectiles out of these weapons. I showed you a piece of solid shot for the uh, for the smoothbore. They had a couple of explosive projectiles, and that's probably what they were using mostly here at the Siege of Harper's Ferry. You notice this uh, piece is hollow in the nose. It's also hollow inside. This thing could be filled with gunpowder, and it would have a fuse bored into the uh, front of the projector. They could cut the fuse for burning time up to five seconds. The trick for the gunner was to estimate the range of his target and set the fuse at, say, three and a half seconds for uh, an 1,100-yard flight. When the gun went off, the burning gases escaping around the projectile would start that fuse burning. If he calculated right as the thing flew through the air, it would explode about the time it reached the target. Then another kind of projectile, an explosive projectile called K-Shot. It had a small core of gunpowder surrounded by musket balls. The idea here was to calculate for the thing to blow open about 75 yards shy of the target, so all those little musket balls could scatter out as they came in. Uh, shell fire uh, was a good incendiary. It set things on fire. <coughs> so if you were firing at troops quartered in wooden buildings or in a wooded area, which, by the way, this wasn't during the Civil War. It was all clear. Shell fire was particularly effective to set things on fire. For really close-in work, and they didn't do it here, they had canister, which were tin cans filled with iron balls or musket balls. You can come up later and take a look at this one. It's got a little window in it so you can see the, the balls inside. This is like a gigantic shotgun blast. When they huh. set the gun off, the canister comes apart, and well, something like this will come flying out. It's like a huge shotgun blast. This was used at mass infantry at fairly close ranges, say 400 yards and less. <coughs> I swallowed a nap. The, uh, 
You might be wondering how they set these things off. They use a little device that's called friction primers. It's a, bra or a brass tube that's got a, uh, an explosive charge in it, something like what's in the head of a kitchen match. It'll strike on anything. It's got a serrated wire running through it. <clears throat> they would run the round down the barrel with a flannel sack of powder behind it. <coughs> One of the troops would run a wire pick through the vent hole. You'll see us do this. Break the sack open. They set this device in the in the uh, in the vent hole and attach it to a lanyard. And when the soldier yanked the lanyard, the serrated wire would whip through the uh, primer, setting it off. It would send a sheet of flame down into the main charge. That's how they set the guns off. The uh, basic unit of artillery during the Civil War was the battery. In the Federal Army, this was usually six guns. In the Confederate Army, usually only four guns. Now, each gun would go into the field attached to the back of a wheel vehicle called a limber. These two vehicles back here are limbers. Each one has a ammunition chest on it, capable of holding up to 50 rounds of ammunition. The cannon would be attached to what looks like a trailer hitch back here. And there'd be a team of horses to pull the unit. Uh, at least four, ideally six horses, arranged in pairs. The back pair on either side of this limber pole. Each left-hand horse had a rider called a driver who would control his horse and the one next to it. Nobody sat up on the limber with reins or anything like that. Then each cannon with its limber would also have a larger vehicle called a caisson, which was like a two-ammunition chest limber, and it would be attached to another limber. And that whole unit would be pulled by four or six horses. So each gun went into the field with four ammunition chests holding up to 200 rounds of ammunition. In addition, the battery would have a traveling forge, uh, a battery wagon with extra entrenching tools and things of that sort, perhaps an ambulance. Our battery had an ambulance assigned to it, and perhaps a couple of supply wagons. Now, the whole kit and caboodle was commanded by a captain. <coughs> each two-gun section, as you see here, would be commanded by a lieutenant. And each gun, with its complement of limbers and caissons, would be commanded by a sergeant, known as the chief of the peace. Each gun, commanded by a corporal, and each caisson and limber commanded by another corporal. And then all the men uh, that would serve the gun or serve as drivers were privates, either cannoneers or drivers. I'm going to call my men out, and they're going to take position around the two guns. We'll tell you what each position is, do a little bit of drive firing, and we'll conclude it with a demonstration. Cannoneers, post! Anybody have any questions at this point? I didn't, I didn't hear how far that projectile would go. That would I probably didn't fun. tell you. I'm glad you asked the question. The bronze gun has a maximum range of about 1,500 yards, and the iron gun has a range of about 1,800 yards. Can you see that white farmhouse down there? Yeah. That's about 1,100 yards from here, so that white farmhouse is well within the range of both these guns. Yes, the uh, smooth bore could hit the house consistently. The rifle might be able to hit the front door consistently. Go ahead. the people in the White House are pretty good. Think it help quick. Four or five batteries would be joined together into a battalion of artillery in the Confederate Army at this time. Each division of infantry, which might be roughly 4,000 men, would have a 20 gun battalion of artillery attached to it under the command usually of a major or a lieutenant colonel. I'm going to call out the men's names and numbers. They're going to identify themselves, and I'll tell you what their jobs are. As I said, each gun was commanded by a corporal known as the gunner. Gunner! Gunner! You see them raising their hands. Each man is a corporal. They have a lot to do. They've got to oversee all the drill, be sure the men are doing the uh, loading procedure properly. They've got to call out the ammunition. Each one of them is holding an aiming device called a pendulum sight. It's his job to sight the gun with the assistance of one of the other men. They've got to see to it that fuses are cut properly. They have a lot to do for a mere corporal. Now, every other man is a private and is known as a cannoneer, and each one of them has a number from one to seven. Number one. The number one men stand to the right front of the gun, and in their right hands they have that ramming device. On one end is a piece of uh, sheep's fleece. That's the sponge. They'll run a wet sponge down the barrel between each round. This is a safety precaution to extinguish any burning debris left over from the previous round, because if they ram one of those powder sacks down and something was still burning in the barrel, they'd have a premature discharge. On the other end of the staff is a wooden block. You'll see them use this to ram the charge down as it's brought forward. These are muzzle-loading guns. 
number two. The number two men stand to the left front of the gun. They're holding that worming device. It's called a worm. It looks like a corkscrew. Between each round, they run that down the barrel, and they do what they call searching the piece. They try to snag into any piece of the powder sack that's left behind to pull it out of the barrel. Again, it's a safety precaution. If anything's left burning down the barrel, you could have a premature discharge. During the loading procedure, you'll see each number two man step in between barrel and wheel. He'll turn in one direction to take the round of ammunition as it's brought forward, reverse position, and insert it in the muzzle for number one man to ram down. In the event of a misfire, which happens uh, fairly frequently, uh, they have to disarm the piece and reprime it. And this is number two man's job because <clears throat> with a failed primer, you got the possibility the gun might go off at any time. If it had a live round in it, it could recoil as much as six feet, which means you had to approach it from the front. So number two man earns his keep during the misfire drill. He has to edge in between wheel and barrel, keeping his body away from the muzzle because the gun still could go off. He has to take the old primer out. He has to run another wire down the uh, vent to clear the piece. He has to set the new primer, and then he edges his way back out. Hopefully we won't have to demonstrate this to you, but I wouldn't be surprised if we do it happen to be frequently. Great! Number three men stand to the right rear of the gun. You'll notice on each of their left thumbs they've got a leather sheet. This is called a thumb stall. During all the ramming procedures, they will step in between wheel and barrel and press that thumb on the vent. This is to prevent air from rushing through the barrel. It's another safety precaution. If there's any burning debris down there, a rush of air will fan it and run, run the risk of another premature discharge. In their other hands, they hold priming wires. You'll see them run the priming wires through the vent hole to break open that powder sack. Also, during the sighting process, they will drop back to the trail spike and assist the gunner in moving the gun right or left, as the gunner indicates. Number four. These are the trigger men. Each one of them holds a lanyard, a long length of rope. Uh, they're the ones who set the friction primer that I showed you, and they run the lanyard to the end of the friction primer. They stand outside the gun with the lanyard taut, and on the command fire, they yank it, setting the friction primer off. Number five. The number five men are posted midway between gun and limber, and on each man's right hip is a large leather haversack known as a gunner's haversack. Their job is to go back to the limber, get whatever ammunition the gunner has specified, put it in that leather sack to protect it from burning debris, run it forward for number two man to take out and insert into the muzzle. Number six, number seven. These men are posted back at the limber. Their jobs uh, are to issue out the ammunition that the gunner specifies, and if uh, setting a fuse is involved, they have to cut the fuse. Now we're going to run through, each crew is going to dry fire one round without actually looking, putting a live round in. I'll explain what they do. The second time through, we'll actually put blank rounds in and fire them. Uh, the reports are not terribly loud if you're concerned about hurting your eardrums, really. The best thing to do is breathe through your mouth while the gun's going off because this legalizes the pressure on either side of your eardrums. But it's really not that bad off the glass. <laughs> Dry fire one round, commence fire, gun number one. Shell, 1,200 yards. Gunner's commanded load, he specified shell as one of the explosive projectiles, and he gave the range of 1,200 yards. So they have to cut the fuse at probably four and a half or five seconds, put it in the haversack, number one man is plunging the gun out, number two man is in position to take the round. The gunner checks to be sure that the uh, fuse has been cut properly. You notice number three man is pressing down on that vent. Number two man is taking the round, he's inserting it in the muzzle. <coughs> number one rams it. Notice how number one keeps his body clear of the muzzle in case of a premature discharge. Right on the sight. Sighting these guns is like sighting a modern open-sighted rifle. You have to see what you're shooting at. They get their vertical elevation by the means of a turn screw under the uh, breech of the gun. Then he slaps the trail to indicate to number three man which way he wants the gun turned. And that's basically it. When he, the gunner throws two hands up, it means he's satisfied. Now, if the gun is loaded and pointed, it's time to prime it. Ready. The command ready, one and two drop back to get away from the muzzle. Three and four step in. Three runs the vent wire through the uh, vent, clear the piece. Number four sets the friction primer. And now the gun's ready to be fired. Fire! We're now securing the piece. Commence fire, one round dry fire, gun number two. Load, solid shot. The gunner's commanded solid shot. That's not a fuse piece, so they don't have to set a primer, or they don't have to set a fuse. Number one is, is uh, sponging the piece. Number three is thumbing the vent. The gunner's taking his preliminary sighting. Five is going back to the limber and has the round in his haversack. 
Number two is in position to take the round. <clears throat> Inserts in the muzzle. Number one man waits for him to clear out. He rams the round down again, keeping his body clear of the muzzle. Now the gun is loaded. Now it's ready to be sighted. The gunner steps in, turns the turn screw, slaps the trail to indicate how he wants the gun moved. <clears throat> Throws his hands up to signify that he's satisfied with the sighting. Ready. On ready, one and two drop back, three and four step in, three clears the vent, four sets the primer. The gun's ready to go. Five. Vent, one round, live fire, gun number one. This time we'll actually put a blank round in and fire it for you. Case, 1,000 yards. We wrap our rounds in aluminum foil because it's a lot safer than uh, flannel, which is what they use. It looks like he's ramming a hoagie down the... Uh, <laughs>